Um, the next session will be done by Janet Chapman from Culture Map, who will be presenting on their experience in building mapping communities in rural Tanzania. She'll be sharing the challenges, the successes, and the lessons that have been learned so far. Uh, and also, as a note, it will be really good to hear that since 2015, crowd to map has been able to um, have 12,500 volunteers worldwide, with 600 of them being on the ground in Tanzania. And with this huge community, they've been able to add 4.1 million buildings on OpenStreetMap, and they've also been able to train community mappers in 26 different areas in Tanzania. So um, as a note and a reminder, if you have any questions during this session, feel free to add those uh, on the session pad, and then we'll be able to answer all these questions at the end. So without taking much more time, uh, Janet can take this away. Hello, my name is Janet Chapman from Crowd to Map Tanzania, and I'm talking today about building mapping communities in rural Tanzania. About seven and a half years ago, I became a project officer and later tr trustee with Tanzania Development Trust, or TDT. They, this is um, an entirely volunteer-run charity registered in the UK that's been supporting grassroots projects in rural Tanzania since 1975. So we have no staff, no offices, we don't pay expenses when we visit projects, and so all of the money raised goes directly to projects. So we support um, typically rural villages in very undeveloped areas of Tanzania, such as um, the north, uh, the west, and the south. So far from the tourist centres of Arusha, Zanzibar, and Dar es Salaam. So this will be a typical village um, that we support. So this is called Zeze village. I know it extremely well. I visited it over 10 times now and it's near to the Burundi border in western Tanzania. So before we started supporting them, people would typically get water from dried up riverbeds such as here. So obviously this leads to huge health issues. So we funded the, the local community to um, dig for water themselves so that they, they, they set up a construction like this. It took them six days to reach water. They created a borehole and then they um, built themselves um, a simple rope pump like this which is really excellent for getting water. Some of the benefits for a scheme like this is that because it's locally made, it empowers local people to learn new skills, but also it means when it breaks down, they can men repair it themselves. Because typically um, with bore, water boreholes, up to 45% are unoperational at any one time in places like Tanzania. So we also um, support income generating projects. So in a village like this, people will live, be living on way less than a dollar a day. So simple income generating projects can have a huge impact. So this is one where women were supported to start small businesses, such as in food production, as here. So I... Since I became a project officer and trustee, I've tried to spend um, at, about two, at least two months a year in traveling around rural Tanzania, visiting our projects on roads like this. So gen typically, especially when it rains, the roads get extremely hard to travel on. There's no maps, or there wasn't when we started, um, no road signs, no street lights. It can be extremely difficult particularly when it rains because then there isn't the roads are terrible and also the, there are no people out to ask directions so um in 2015 i was visiting this school ikondo and um it was raining you couldn't the person i was with didn't know where it was so we drove around for 2 hours looking for the school constantly phoning then the school phoning us saying where are you we're waiting um, etc. It was extremely challenging and frustrating. I live in London. I'm used to having maps. I'm used to being able to just put something in my phone and know where I'm going. 
rural Tanzania was not like that at all. So this was extremely frustrating for me and them. So schools like Ikondo, they're in remote areas. Their students walk extremely long distances to and from school, sometimes up to two or three hours each way. And they have, often they even have to carry the water that they then need to, to clean the classrooms with. So extremely challenging circumstances and girls in particular have additional challenges in that they are put into vulnerable situations. When the students are ill, as in here, this student from Ikondo is, uh, has malaria, there's no ambulances, so the students are carrying him up the mountain two hours to the hospital. Here is a school here. There is a hospital two hours up the mountain. So Ikondo School um, had this building, which was supposed to be um, a head teacher's house. It was unfinished. They wanted to turn it into a girls' hostel. So T TDT funded them to do that. So now, they now have had a hostel. Um, all of the girls that came to the school, that was over 300 girls, really wanted to stay there. There are only um, 50 places. So it was very difficult for them to dis for the school to decide who should have those places. So we trained the teachers um, and the local people to actually add where the, the places where the where the girls came from onto the map. So they trained the local the the girls. We had a few cheap smartphones, so they the phone went home to with one of the um, students each day and came back um, and they they had added the places in their village. So from that, we were able to teach them how to add, um, add all of those places and create a simple map. This was the first time the school had any idea where the students were coming from and how far they were. And from that, they were able to um, select which students were the were the most deserving to come. It wasn't only based on distance, it was also based on the, their vulnerability, whether they were um, single parents, families, etc. But distance was certainly important and they were really delighted to have a map showing where the students came from. And these are some of those girls who were selected for the hostel, who were delighted to be there. Girls have additional um, challenges because they are also expected to collect the water, collect the firewood, etc. So being in the hostel gives them additional opportunities to study in the evening, which they're extremely um, grateful for. So to rural Tanzania, generally, it looks something like this, or it certainly did when we started, as opposed to Dar es Salaam, which looks more like um, London, partly because of excellent efforts by people like Romani Huria and Open Map for Development Tanzania that have had World Bank money to do a really excellent job in showing mapping Dar es Salaam, particularly for flood resilience. So rural Tanzania really needs maps. And we've been working with many different places to help do that. And this is, is a short video showing some of the reasons why they do need maps. Mapping Serengeti district, especially rural areas, is very, very important. This can help us as safe house staff to see how to reach those girls who will be in danger in their rural villages. Officials can use the map to locate where the schools, uh, clinics and the community centers are 
in order to plan for the future development of other services that are needed in the community. We use the uh, smartphone that we have to map different areas, especially in villages where most of vulnerable people and groups live there. So we manage to map uh, different local government offices, water point, operation center, and the different areas in local villages in Simil region. Thanks to our hot micro grant, we have been able to buy phones uh, for mapping and we have trained the youth mappers in rural areas uh, whereby uh, more than 200 ma mappers we have already trained. The maps we have produced will help activists fighting FGM to better protect girls at risk. Local officials to clearly see where schools, clinics, water points and the population centers are now and a better plan future provisions. Over 1.8 million households are on the map. For the first time, and the local people in 10 areas of rural Tanzania now have access online and on paper to maps of their villages that they have created themselves. So, at Santa Sana, hot. So that was actually quite an old video. Um, that was from 2017. So since then, we've um, actually added um, over 4 million buildings now and we have around 14,000 online um, volunteers. But the need for maps is still there. So this is an example of maps that we want to start creating, showing how far people have to go for, to from to water points um, from health facilities. Typically, many of the health facilities do not have running water and it can be quite a long way from them. The village that I've mentioned at the beginning, Zeze, they, they are particularly interested in um, creating a land use plan. This is something that is um, could be extremely useful and we're starting to do a joint project with um, the open map for development in Dar es Salaam to pilot um, cheaper ways to do very accurate mapping that will be useful for, for land cadastres. But we've, as I said, we've been training people to use maps.me. However, when we first started, you, th this would be a typical um, screen that you would get on maps.me. So no no roads, no buildings already added. It's extremely difficult, particularly if you're using a cheap smartphone, which we are, to actually work out accurately where your location is. So we've been um, recruiting people. So now we have over 14,000 online volunteers, the majority of whom have come from UN online volunteers and other online volunteering sites. They're from all over the world and they've been um, they're helping do the base map, sh adding the roads and the buildings so that local people can then add the points of it, um, interest in their villages. So this is a typical satellite image um, showing some round buildings here that, um, are, that we're adding. So when people sign up um, to our online volunteering, we've got some very comprehensive instructions now because we're doing all of the training online. So we're also um, using RAPID now, which is machine learning generated roads and buildings. 
to um, help with the mapping. Um, and we've got we're using the comprehensive um, tracking guide, tagging guide for African roads, with some pictures to show people because many of the people will never have been to these areas. We have a very comprehensive Slack channel. We have over four and a half thousand people in there now. So when we have new mappers, we um, ask them to, to join the Slack channel, introduce themselves, but then to give um, ask for feedback on their first mapping attempts. Then we have some extremely um, experienced mappers who then give them feedback so that they can improve their mapping. We've also set up a number of online tests to help um, particularly new mappers, so to, to ensure that they really understand how to map well. And the, these tests, if you get, um, they're full of screenshots, etc., like this one, and if you get um, 100%, then you can get a badge. So if you're interested in that, that these are, we've, we've, so far we've done the buildings one, we are producing the other ones for roads um, and many other things as time goes on. So we've made huge progress. Um, this is shows um, an area of um, where the FGM safe house is. So Google is just showing this. Um, you can see that the example for from OpenStreetMap, a, a huge um, We've, we've come a long way. So we have really two mapping communities, the remote mappers and the community mappers. And they're extremely different communities and we engage with them in different ways. So the remote mappers generally are very educated, often, you know, they're graduates. They've been using maps all the throughout their life. So they're very um, experienced in, in um, using maps on their phones, on paper, etc. They for navigation. Um, they generally have a, access to a large range of technology. They generally have a la at least a laptop, a smartphone, um, good internet, you know, in their place of work and at home. If we contrast that to the, the community mappers, many of them did not complete secondary school. Some of them never really went to school at all. Um, there, was, there have been no maps available of their local area, so they, they're not, they haven't used them. They would never generally, most of them hadn't used a smartphone or if they had very, very intermittently. Um, very few people had access to a laptop or been, even been online before. And access to technology, access to connectivity is a continual problem. So many of most people live in villages that are out off um, mains electricity. So if they're lucky, they have access to solar for charging. Um, but that's generally problematic, especially during the rainy season. Um, so and getting online is expensive. Uh, and infrequent, so people don't don't have the luxury of a of um, a connection all the time. So one of the things that we've been trying to do to build our community over the long term is to go to the to places like universities where people do usually have a degree, uh, some more access um, to technology and internet usually. So, but some of the training in universities has been more like this, i.e. standing at the front with one phone, uh, very few phones available, very few laptops, etc. Um, the the Wi-Fi doesn't work, often the electricity's gone off, etc. So, but extremely challenging circumstances. Um, and when there are lap laptops, the, um, there are a few and people have to share and generally the, the, the people have not had access to um, technology all the time. So you, really you can assume that they, you can't assume that they've, um, well, you can't assume anything really. Um, 
This is um, setting up the Youth Mapper chapter at the Institute of Rural Development Planning. Um, so we asked, we were setting up the um, committee. So we we told them that we want that we should have two men and two women. When we asked for volunteers from the men, everybody put their hand up. When we asked for volunteers from the women, nobody put their hand up. So it's. There are very traditional roles, uh, gender roles in rural Tanzania. So, you know, it takes more of an effort to get women to come forward. Eventually, women did put themselves forward. They just needed a bit more encouragement. And actually, when they got involved, they were actually more capable than the men. Also, if you're sharing equipment, this will be a typical typical scene. So you have <clears throat> one laptop between five people and, of course, the man um, has his fingers on the keyboard. So, the, And also, in when we were doing the mapping training in the villages, generally it was men have much greater access to smartphones than women do. So when we got the hot micro grant in 2017, it did enable us to recruit a lot more female mappers for the first time because we were able to buy cheap $30 smartphones and train people. However, female mappers in rural areas do face additional challenges. A lot of men told them that they shouldn't be out doing mapping. They should be at home in the kitchen. They had quite a lot of harassment and threats, um, even inappropriate um, touching and plots to try and lure them into remote places but women the women mappers that we trained were extremely passionate about mapping uh, because they saw very quickly that mapping was important important to the community and it was actually a, a means towards greater gender equality so women learning skills about um, using phones about putting their communities on the map, about being treated um, equally. And one of the initiatives that we've um, been very involved in is mapping against female genital mutilation and, and gender-based violence, which is very prevalent in certain areas. Um, and I've done a lightning talk around that if you're interested. So why do women keep mapping in these even though that they are subjected to this harassment and even danger. So they, they're passionate about developing their communities um, and protecting girls from female genital mutilation and gender-based violence. But they also want to help um, other women in their villages, you know, learn some digital skills and to be part of changing their communities more generally. So... The mapping community can really help this, I think, to recognise that rural rural women in places like Tanzania face a lot of additional challenges um, and they do need encouragement so, you know, to participate. So things like women-only groups, role models, um, being mindful of male domination in training activities are really important. Um, and we've really tried to map aspects that are, are of importance to women, such as FGM and gender-based violence, but also access to clinics and water points, also particularly um, is of importance to women. And it would be really good, I think, to have more materials on why mapping rural areas benefits women. And there are additional funding needs because women are much less likely to have access to technology. So to, to help with this, we've set up um, uh, digital champions in all 87 villages in Serengeti, where FGM is a particular problem, with a smartphone um, for the f first time. And then they have access to um, SD content on the smartphone, which has a lot of material around education, health and FGM. So these women um, digital champions are linked together in a WhatsApp group that enables further training and they help they help monitor um, the status of women in the village, 
protect any girls, but they were also uh, responsible for mapping those villages. And this was part of a project um, called Women Connect that started in 2019, but we're continuing it because we recognise the value um, of this, despite the fact we no longer have any funding. So this shows um, some of the new smartphone users um, in villages seeing a map of their village for the first time on a phone. Um, we've also been adding um, clinic locations from open government data and also using water point location data to add village names, which, which is particularly useful for COVID contact tracing, but also to develop the map. So now we have um, almost 14,000 volunteers, um, online volunteers, and we've added um, 6.4 million edits. We were recently featured in a podcast, if you're interested in learning more. So we've tried really hard to build the mapping community in Tanzania, Tanzan particularly in rural areas. So in 2017, we organised the first State of the Map Tanzania. Um, so this was held in the University of Dar es Salaam and we were able to get some small funding to bring people from rural Tanzania into Dar es Salaam for this three-day conference um, and also some youth mappers from other East African countries. So this was an extremely big deal, particularly for some of these rural mappers. For, for many of them, it was the first time that they'd um, been to Dar es Salaam. It was the first time they'd been to a university and the first time that they'd met volunteers from overseas, particularly, um, to, and actually benefited from some mapping training. And we would really like to repeat this at some point. We've also organised open data events. So um, this one was in 2018 in Mwanza. Um, again, we were able to get together, um, and bring some people into, into Mwanza to the Institute of Rural Development Planning from remote rural areas. And I've met many of them um, pre since, and they still talk about this. It was a very um, big deal. And we had an event um, this year in March as well. So this is something which really helps build the mapping community, and we thank everybody that helped um, with these activities. So we've we've trained many people on Maps.me um, and the use of maps. So we try to we train um, local government officials and the police. So the police particularly liked Maps Maps.me. Um, it helps them to to get quickly to places, particularly in the middle of the night. The girls at risk of FGM. Um, typically, they will the activists and the police will get a phone call in the middle of the night saying girls are about to be cut in Kabanja Banja village. Without maps or road signs or street lights, it, it was very difficult to get there. Now they have trained, been trained in Maps.me and we've mapped um, those areas. It's much more easily to find them. So here are some um, digital champions uh, <coughs> seeing a map of their village for the first time and adding <coughs> those places that are missing from the map. So having better maps has helped protect many girls from FGM. And we've trained people all around rural Tanzania now. Um, in 2018, we were invited to organise a mapathon at the um, United Nations General Assembly and we had um, marathon events, satellite events in 60 different countries and here are some of them. So thank you to everybody who helped with that. So lessons learnt. Engaging um, rural communities is extremely hard. Um, so there are issues with almost everything. Um, Issues with setting up the phones, with charging the phones, with um, access to connectivity, training, um, 
you generally have to start with quite a low base so you're starting the training with you know how do you use a smartphone but it's extremely rewarding so people it generally the, um, many of of the community mappers have not had um, access be the to, to many educational opportunities so any training opportunities that they get are hugely appreciated and although at the beginning people found it difficult to um, envisage what the the benefits of mapping their communities were now they really get it and they're very passionate about putting themselves on the map women have additional challenges um, and that i think should be recognized by the community um, building relationships is key. Um, you need people, um, you need to be working with people who trust you um, and to build up that trust takes time. Otherwise people can't really see, you know, they, they have to own the project themselves. So this for us is a long-term project. Um, we're going. We're keeping building up the map of Tanzania um, as long term. So, please help us. Um, we really. We're all volunteers. Um, we have no funding. Um, m many of us, including myself, are not um, GIS experts. So, if you would like to get involved, those are my contact details. Um, please get in touch and help us map Tanzania. Thank you. So we have three questions. So the first one, Janet, is what happens when oral or local tradition differs from a national naming convention or even databases when different languages collide in spelling or even the whole name? For example, we know, we know from India that spelling of geographic names differs between Hindu and Bengali, which is resolved by the India Geographical Survey by standardizing geographic names only in the English language. So uh, I think you can go ahead and answer that bit first. Thank, thank you, Laura, and uh, thank you, Matthias, I think, who, answered, who asked the question. Um, so I believe generally um, we defer to the community mappers. So, I mean, it, there can be many cases where there isn't um, a, a, an official name, for example, for roads and so on, but there may be um, a locally known name. So we would would use that. Um, but I guess it, um, it does depend to some extent on who has added um, that data. So if it's official government data, then it would have come from that source for example we've um i think this was missing from the video but we've added um government data about health centers and um, schools and so on so that would be um the official name but when we've trained community mappers then they would be um potentially adding the name that they um that they are using um i don't know if you want to add to this laura um because i think this is an area that you have a lot of experience in and i know um J jeffrey um has too i don't know if he's here i think you're muted i think you fully answered it um okay. yeah i have nothing to add <laughs> okay so the next question is um what do you think is the main importance of the map to the community? Is it about using the map and the data to lobby for development or for visibility to the world or for potential investments in the areas that you're working in? I think it's for many things to different people. Um, so yes, I think it is absolutely for those things. I mean, it is about literally putting people on the map so that they, you know they're counted, they matter. Um, so one of the projects that we have is particularly to help protect girls from female genital mutilation, um, which I've also done a lightning talk about at exactly the same time, I think. Um, so for them, it's about rescuing girls. So it's about finding the places quickly where girls are at risk. 
I mean, maps, if you think about for yourself, you know, maps are useful for very many different purposes. So they're obviously vital for navigation. They're vital to find people quickly if there's an accident or they're at risk. But they're also vital to have a, a sense of where the facilities are in a community and where they need to be developed. So, for example, um, I often visit people like district medical officers. They generally don't have a map of showing where all the clinics are um, and the distribution. Um, you know, the district medical officer won't have a map of where all the schools are. You know, the schools won't have a map of where their students are coming from. So, the, the, um, and often if people haven't had access to those local maps, they don't necessarily always know what they could do with them. So I think for, for us, it's a, this is a long-term project about building up local knowledge and empowering people in very remote, um, disadvantaged areas to build up their knowledge so that they can start making the, you know, the decisions themselves about what they could use maps for. So it's an ongoing process, I would say. And um, thank you to who asked the question. And we're always very open to talking to people about um, building up good case studies for how maps are useful for development. Because um, I'm not sure that there are as many good case studies of that as, as there could be. OK. Um... The third one is more of a comment. Uh, and the person is from the University of Chicago. And here she just says that uh, the project is a very incredible project and uh, uh, they applaud you for the amazing work, especially the emphasis on the lives of girls uh, that you're highlight and that you're highlighting the challenges of equipment and access to internet, even in local universities. Um, Thank you. I, the the uh, the video cut out just as I was getting to the bit about girls, actually. So I was just going on to talk about some of the further issues. For example, if there's one laptop in a group, then the, the generally the 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 male will often have it, um, and the issues that some of the um, women have in rural areas um, being threatened when they go out mapping, being told that they should go back to the kitchen, etc. So yes, um, we absolutely see this project as about empowering women. When we first started, um, we were relying on mappers that had their own phone, uh, which we are still predominantly. And in rural Tanzania, very few women have access to a smartphone. So when we got a micro grant from Humanitarian Open Street, Street Map in 2017, we were able to buy some cheap $30 smartphones that um, we were able to recruit more female mappers, which was what we always wanted to do. And that is something that we still want to expand upon. So and um, if you'd like to get involved, please join us. Anyone. Yeah, great. Uh uh, the person say that they are already on your website and then <laughs> be reaching out to, right. to see how they can engage. Oh, she's Annie. Hi. Uh, so the, well, the, 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 the second last question uh, is from Greg and Rose or Greg Rose. <laughs> uh, uh, they ask, does your group use tasking manager for setting up mapping tasks and projects? Yes, we do. Our, our tasks are under Tanzania Development Trust. Yes. Okay. So, um, we, um, so mm -hmm. please, if you please go and uh, help map in them if if you're interested, and join our Slack channel. I'll put the link in the um, pad in a minute. Okay. And the last one would be. Do you welcome remote mappers from other areas to help with their projects? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> of course, very welcome. I mean, most of the remote mappers are from all over the world. Um, so, yes, any, everyone is welcome. Okay. Um, those are the only questions that were asked. Uh, again, I apologize for the technical hitch that cut this session short. Uh, but to learn more about crowd to map you can be sure to check out crowd to map on all social media pages on twitter and facebook 
and Janet will be sure to reach back to you with, in, with any answers for any questions that you might have. Yes. Um, and she's also going to post uh, a link to the session pad that will lead you to maybe the website where you can get more information. Absolutely, and I'll also post a link to the video at the point where it drops, so if people want to um, listen to the rest of it. Okay, um, I guess that will be it. Thank you so much, Janet. It's always nice to hear about uh, the Crowd Trauma Project in Tanzania and looking forward to contribute more and participate. Thank you so much for all your help, particularly with the youth mappers that you've been training. So thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye. Bye.